<laughs> Take your Bible, turn First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Here we're going to go into some instructions that Paul gives to ladies for conduct. As basically your conduct, not only in the church, but out of the church in public and at home with the husband. And just some instructions that the Lord gives. These instructions are very contrary to the way the world thinks. It goes contrary to everything you're going to be taught out there. And it, it just doesn't agree with it. But the Lord has a different way of looking at things. And there's a reason He looks at them a certain way. Sometimes you just have to sit back and say, Lord, you're smarter than I am. You know what you're talking about. And on this passage, you ladies, I would suggest you listen to the Lord and not the media. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. So the first thing we come into is uh, an instruction on apparel. Now one thing that gets every man in trouble is when he tells his wife what to wear. <laughs> I mean, or if he doesn't answer the way she wants when she asks how she looks. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that gets you in a whole lot of hot water real quick. It's not something that the Lord takes lightly though. First of all, it tells you modest apparel. It says in, in like manner that women adore themselves in modest apparel. Now what is modest apparel? Modest apparel is apparel that does not attract attention to oneself. That would be a best way to look at it. It's apparel that does not attract attention to oneself. Every instinct about you ladies is to attract attention through your dress. That is usually normal instinct for a woman. Or at least most women that I've known. That is their normal instinct. They will do that regularly to attract attention through their dress. Now sometimes, depending on the woman's heart, depends on what kind of attention she's trying to attract. But notice in the Bible here, it's not just wrong attention, it's attention in general. I've seen some ladies where they overdress spiritually to attract attention to themselves to look spiritual. Guess what? That's still not modest. It's still not modest. So there are several different ways a lady can dress to attract attention. First, let's look at the immodest apparel. Uh, take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 7. Uh, there are several passages through the Bible where it addresses this. Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, pick up verse 10. Uh, let's go back up to verse 7, get the context. And behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Here's a very wicked woman, a woman of the world, that has a certain attire. What's that? It's the attire of a harlot. You say, what attire of that? Well, uh, there used to be a time in the country you could tell the difference. Well, it's hard to tell anymore. It's generally what the most of them wear. This, this is a rough statement, but it really tells the truth of the matter. Dr. Ruckman said when I was in school, he says the colleges have put every hard-working whore out of business today. That's a crude way to put it, but that's really the truth. The attire of the harlot... And basically what it's saying is there's a certain attire that attracts a sexual attention. That's what the attire of the harlot is. You're trying to attract attention for the wrong reason, for the wrong thing. 
Ladies, do you want somebody to take and marry you for your looks or for your heart? It's for the heart. Amen. More a man loves a woman, the better she looks to him. Amen. That's the truth. The more he loves her, the better she looks. The more they disdain somebody, the less they look. Take your Bible and turn to uh, turn also to Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five. And modest apparel does attract attention, but it attracts the wrong time type of attention, and it causes the heart to think in the wrong way. Matthew chapter five. Look at verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now the interesting thing about that verse is he commits adultery what? With her. Why? Because she put the thought in his mind. As a general rule of thumb, you say, what about the guys that think that way all the time? Well, you can't give account for that. But if there's part, guilty part on your part, because you dress the part, well, it's there. And that's what the Lord's pointing out. With this particular case, because of her attire, she's attracting attention that should not be. That's just about how every celebrity gets to their position. They attract attention the way they should not. She's not to attract that type of attention by her dress. She's not also not to draw attention to oneself to give a false pretense of herself. Look at the last part of the verse, verse 9, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Sobriety is a type of seriousness. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now those things are not necessarily of the uh, nature to draw attention to oneself for the wrong reason, but it is still to draw attention to oneself. Broided hair, costly array, pearls or gold or costly array. You say, well, what is that doing? Well, it's trying to dress royalty to look at importance. Well, that's not what you're supposed to do as Christian women. You know what you're supposed to look like? A godly woman. Professing godliness. Modesty. It ought to be the look of a lady. You say, well, you should look like a godly lady. Take your Bible and look, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. I think many preachers abuse this verse, but it's still a very good verse for women to look at and to memorize. Deuteronomy chapter 22. In this day and age, it's a good verse for men to look at too. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. The women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on women's garments, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So ladies, you should be a lady. You should look like a lady. You should act like a lady. You say, well, don't you believe in equal rights? No, I don't. Not a bit. I don't believe in equal rights. I, I believe the lady is the weaker vessel made to be a helpmeet for God's man, and that's the place that she should take and she should act in such a way. She's not to be a man. And the men are not to be women. <laughs> I mean, that's... You're in a day and age where women are trying to masculine themselves and men are being feminized. That's the day and age you live in. Men are trying to be women and women are trying to be men. And then the outcome is something that's sick. It's just, it's not correct. And uh, the Bible tells you that. You say, well, how far do you go with that? Uh, and down south, you'll run into many preachers. They'll say, well, a woman should never wear pants because that's that which pertaineth to a man. Uh, I beg to pardon. I would never be caught dead in my wife's pants. So how do you say that's what pertaineth to a man? Or... You can sit there and go this way. Do you realize when that verse was written, 
men wore robes and skirts. Boy, let's see him get around that one. Okay? Now, I will say this. If you wear pants, make sure it's godly apparel and that which pertaineth to a woman. I mean, I have my own standards of what I want my wife to wear to church. And my standards may be a little bit higher than yours on some things. I grew up Southern. I got some old Southern fashion values about things. Are you going to force that on your congregation? No. Why? Because they're just my standards. I can't take you to a verse and say, this is what you have to do or you're sin. But I can take you to a verse and say, wear something that's godly apparel and that's modest. That pertains to a woman. You say, where is that? No. You ladies know what pertains to a woman more than I do. <laughs> Make it feminine. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What about the tomboys? My sister was a tomboy. You know what she did? She sewed. So she took and sewed her ankle length dress out of camouflage. Well, you didn't look at her and think she was a man. She was still a lady. <laughs> Back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 10. But that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, how do you profess godliness? Well, you don't do it by your apparel. In other words, a lady can dress with a certain scenario like, oh, the preacher's wife dressed this way, so we'll all dress this way. So I've known of some Bible institutes where the women in the Bible institute looks like the leader's wife. And it's like, almost like they came out of an assembly line. They all look the same. They have the, all the same dress, all the same hairstyle, all the same everything. Because they look at them like, well, that's what godly is supposed to be, so that's what I'll be. It's not what, that's not correct. It's just not correct. You, you can be your own individual person, just as long as it's modest and professing godliness. But what profess godliness? Your good works, lady. Your good works, your heart. That's what professes godliness. It has nothing to do with your dress. I've seen some godly dressed women that's just as wicked as an ace of spades in the heart. Black as coal in the heart, man. It's just wicked. And same with a man, too. Same with a man. That's no different with men. Just because they wear a suit and a tie don't mean they're godly. Amen. Personally, well, I ain't going to say what I say think personally about suit and tie. <laughs> but uh, it's never been my cup of tea. I wear one because it's the view that people have of what it's supposed to be. So I'm not going to take and wound their weak conscience and getting up here in my combat boots and my blue jeans and my flannel shirt, which is my preferred wear. There's a part of it where it's for testimonial sake. And a lot of churches will set up a dress code for testimonial sake for the ladies that work within the church. I have no problem with that. If a pastor so desires to do that, if he's do, set in it as a testimonial sake, well, then follow the guidelines for the testimonial sake of the church. But just remember, that's not what makes you spiritual. What makes you spiritual? That which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. You say, well, Pastor Witter, you didn't tell me what to wear. No, I didn't. You have to ask your husband that. I'll let him get in trouble. <laughs> you say, do you tell your wife what to wear? Sometimes. You get in trouble? Yeah. <laughs> and I take the load. <laughs> Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, pick up verse 1. Likewise, ye wise, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. Now, what's the conversation of the wise? That is not what you say, but your conduct in the context of this verse. You realize conversation isn't just what you talk back and forth. If you go look at the dictionary, it has to do with your conduct. And many times in the Bible, when you see the word conversation, what's 
talking about is your conduct. The conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not... Now here it is again. You get it two times. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a great price. Ladies, God is more worried about your heart than your outward appearance. Your heart is what's important. If your heart is right with God, your outward appearance will follow. I know that to be true. When the outward appearance doesn't follow, it's because there's something wrong here. Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in what? The sight of God, a great price. Do you want to know how to be the best wife you can ever be? Be pleasing to God. Amen. Be pleasing to God. If you're pleasing to God, you'll treat your husband the way you should, in the right way. All right, back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to come back to this passage here. Kind of hold your finger here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 11 on the next verse. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. By suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now this is another touchy subject. So we go from the peril, now we go to the mouth. Like I said, this was going to be a fun passage to, to teach. Um, learn in silence with all subjection. You say, how do you learn in silence? Well, you have to have a meek. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of what? A meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being subjection unto their own husbands. So what is that? A meek and quiet woman is not one that is going to have her way or make it happen her way with her loud mouth. I remember one time I was trying to help a guy out who was going through some marriage problems, and they wound up in a divorce. Both sides was very much in the wrong in this case, which uh, many times it winds up being. His wife comes out while he's working on his car, I was helping him work in his car, just screaming and hollering at the top of his lungs at him, chewing him out. And she had just went off on him. Then she saw me. She backed off, shut up, and went back into the house. And he turned and looked at me, he goes, you see what I got to put up with? That was his attitude. You see what I got to put up with? The basic instinct of any man when that happens is to come back with full force. And then that's the way the contention happens and it builds, it builds until it explodes. And that's exactly what happened in their marriage. I mean, there, were, there was no putting it back together. It went beyond that point. Lady, if you want to save your marriage, it's better done on your knees than trying to straighten your husband out. Why do you know that? Because he's not going to take and listen to you unless he already has a humble heart and knows what you're saying is true. I'm not saying the husband doesn't always listen to his wife. I listen to Rebecca quite often. I don't always let her know it, <laughs> but I listen to her. I listen to what she has to say. Why? Because you have to study your wife. You have to know what's in her heart, and you have to know what's bothering her to lead her well. As a husband, if you love your wife, you listen to them, 
to try and find out what's bothering them. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take it. Go with them on something. But you do have to listen. The ladies learn in silence with all subjection. Now, now here's an, another problem. With all subjection, what, do, what does that mean? That means you have to put yourself subjected under his authority. You have to look at your husband as being the one with authority. And you're going to humble yourself and put yourself under that authority. Why? You say, well, I, I walk side by side with my husband. It won't work. Why? Because God didn't set it up that way. Because everything in the world goes... No, because God didn't set it up that way. That's not the way God set it up. Uh, God set it up where the husband has the authority. Even in this case, where look how it, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, who she's trying to win. She's trying to win a husband who does not believe in God. He's an atheist husband. Uh, look at what it says. For after this manner in the old times, the holy women also who trusted in God. Who trusted in God? The lady did. Adorn themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband. Look at verse 1. Without, um, Likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word. So the husband's not obeying the word of God. They also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So she's not sitting there preaching at them. Just by her conduct, he sees... She's a much better person than he is. And many a times that is the case. Many a times, ladies, you've got the man beat with spirituality. I've seen that time and time again. You say, how do you show them that? Through your conduct. Because if you tell them, it just ain't going to work out well for you. You can try... You didn't think it's going to work, but the Scriptures tell you it ain't going to work. You might want to listen to the Scriptures on that one. You say, well, I'm going to straighten them out. All right, see how that works for you. I'm just telling you, see how it works for you. That's not what the Scriptures tell you to do. Your conduct is going to help you much better than your mouth in straightening your husband out. He sits there and he hollers at you about not getting the house cleaned and not doing that. And you just polish that house from top to bottom and make him eat his words. You know what's he going to be able to do? He's not going to be able to do anything. Here, here's a good advice for you. If you're having a controversy with your husband and he's accusing you of stuff and you think it's unjust accusation, make it where there's no way he can make that accusation without making himself just a flat out liar. You say, how do you do that? With your conduct. And you say, well, then he's still bruised. Get on your knees and sit God on him. Because there does come a time where with some husbands, the lady's best defense is to go to God with it. You say, well, I'm going to take and go to him with it, straighten him out. No, you're not. You're not. It's not going to work. Why? Because he ain't wired that way. If he was wired that way, you wouldn't be having the problem in the first place. Back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but be in silence. Now here's a good verse that you want to take in its context and not out of its context. Does this mean that a woman cannot teach anything in the church? No. Actually, women teach in the Bible all the time. Take your Bible and let's look at Titus. Look at Titus chapter 2. This is why you don't want to take something out of its context. In the context, it's showing you what, that you're not usurp, to usurp the authority of the man. Where when your teaching comes, it's teaching and usurping authority, putting your authority over the man's authority. That's the context where you're not supposed to teach. But does that mean that you cannot teach? No, it doesn't mean that you cannot teach. In Titus, the lady's actually told to teach. Titus chapter 2, 
and look at verse 3. Titus 2, 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. I'm sorry, I'm in 3. I mixed the numbers up. 2, 3. For the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers, what are they? Teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So what does it tell you? It tells you to teach the young ladies how to be a young lady. You know what you're also going to teach? You're going to teach your children. And you're going to teach children. They're keepers at home, right? How do you be a keeper at home if you're not taking care of the kids? The husband's role is the provider. He's got to go out and provide, but the kids have to be raised by their mother. Many times they are raised by their mother. I was raised by my mother. Why? Because dad was always out working. Say, oh, you're old-fashioned. Yes, I am. And I have no apologies for it. You know, I got myself in trouble at work because the service writer wanted to help me do some work on a car and she's a lady. I told her, no, I'll, I'll get one of these guys. She goes, you're prejudiced against women. I said, accused correctly. <laughs> Man, <laughs> just... I mean, what? how do you get around it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and that's, I'm not saying a lady can't work, but, you know, there's a position for her. I know society's set up where most of you ladies have to work. I mean, I'm not saying you can't work. But if the man can do it, it's better for the man to do it. You know, some men can't work and the wife has to. So is there anything wrong with it? No. You go to Proverbs chapter 31, that lady provided. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you don't usurp the authority. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So if you have a woman in a church that's in a position of authority, that church is incorrect. The ladies, you can't be a pastor. You can't be the adult Sunday school teachers with men. And you cannot be the deacon. I'm sorry. You're not in a position of authority and you're not going to be put in a position of authority. Not why I'm the pastor of this church. Now you say, uh, what about when you're gone? Well, you get rid of all the men and then maybe you can get them under your subjection then maybe you can be the pastor, you know. But it's not going to happen here. Why? Because it's against God's way of doing things. He didn't make it that way. He didn't design it to be that way, and He didn't want it to be that way. Look at verse 13 through 15. I've got to wrap this chapter up. I don't want to go two rounds on this thing. And Adam was first formed, and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So what he's saying is when the sin happened, the woman is the weaker vessel and she was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. Did he still sin? Yeah, he knew exactly what he was doing when he sinned. He sinned because he loved his wife and went ahead and took the fruit that she was given and he knew exactly what he was doing. There wasn't no deception with Adam. Now the woman, she was deceived. Why? She was created to be the man's help me and she is called the weaker vessel. When she fell, part of her curse was to be in subjection to the man. And he's going to rule over her. Who gave that sentence to you? God did. You say, I don't like it. Take it up with God. I wouldn't like it either if I was in your shoes, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, God still put you on. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11.3. That's the verse. 
But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's the order God sets it up, where the man is subject underneath Christ, and the woman is subject underneath man. Now, here's one thing I will explain about that. Christ is above the man. So you do, ladies, you do not disobey God in Christ to obey the man. You understand that? In other words, if the man tells you to do something that's a flat out sin that's against God, you say, no, but I'll be willing to take the consequences. No, I'm going to serve Christ. There, there is some common sense to this thing. There is an order to it. I've heard some preachers go, oh, that woman is supposed to obey the man no matter what, and then if it's something wrong, then the man's accountable for it. That's not scriptural either. I can prove that time and time again where God does not handle it that way. Ananias and Sapphira are two good ones. Sapphira, the wife, guess what? She got in trouble because she followed her husband. And she dropped dead because she sinned against God. But she obeyed her husband. There you go in the example. So you obey your husband as long as it's not a sin against Christ who is the head of the husband. Very quickly, verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What does the verse mean? Exactly what it says. And that's not the salvation of the soul. That's just saved from sinning in childbearing and being discouraged. Why? Because when you go through childbearing, your hormones are out of whack and you go through one of the worst times of your life. As at least if you're anything like my wife, you do. I mean, hey, you talk about this depression. Anybody would be depressed if they threw up five times a day for nine months. I mean, how does that not depress you? And then your hormones are out of whack. I mean, uh, you know, walk in and the wife's sitting there crying. You say, what's wrong? And they give you an explanation and it's laughable. It's like, really? You're crying over that? <laughs> I mean, that's... I remember one time I took and tried helping Rebecca cut up some lettuce when she was pregnant with Nathaniel. She'd start bawling, I'll cut up my own lettuce. Even today she doesn't know why she blew up on me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, she's going through a time in life where it's just she's out of control of her emotions. And how does she get through that? Well, she continues in faith, believing the things that's been told her. Your, your faith is going to help you through in that time. Believe in the Word of God. Continue in faith and charity with holiness and sobriety. Now, who has to do that? Look at the verse. If they continue in faith. It has to be the husband and the wife. The husband helps the wife through at that time. He has to help her through that time. Well, a lot of husbands have time because that's a high standard for them to meet. <laughs> you know how Christ loved the church? Perfectly. And that's the way a husband should, should love the wife. The, the husband is to take the, what the verse is saying as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay? The husband's to love the wife. Now, that's not saying the wife is supposed to love the husband over Christ. That's not telling the husband he's supposed to love the wife over Christ. So it's not taking anything from Christ. What he's doing is giving an example to the husband how he should love his wife. Christ loved the church enough to die for her and to forgive her of all her sins, no matter what unconditionally. Is that not what Christ did? So the verse is teaching that when a husband loves his wife the way that he should, she should be put much higher than he puts himself. You know who the husband's supposed to honor? You. The husband honors his wife as the weaker vessel. In other words, he's, he's to put her on a very high pedestal. Down south, if you speak against the wife, the husband has every right to come down on you with everything. Why? Because he's the one that defends his wife. But see, they have a different way of thinking than they do up here. I mean, I've heard stories where people do stuff to their wives 
uh, other man do something to their wife and they just let it go. Or down south, they go to jail for a while because they knock somebody's teeth out. You need to stand up for her. She's your wife. You put her first and foremost. Now I know there's always the marital spat. That's going to happen. But you know what a good husband will do? He'll forgive you quickly. And you ladies have a hard time forgiving the husband that quick. <laughs> but that husband should forgive you very quick. He has a hot head, but he needs to forgive quickly. Yeah, because he, uh, the Bible also tells the husband, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, many divorces happen because the husband is not loving her the way he should and he winds up getting bitter, then he can't forgive her and the divorce goes through. Where if he could just forgive her, it'd be fine. But you're not putting him or her above Christ. Christ is always first. Christ is always first. It's just Christ gave you the example to follow. Or gave the husband the example to follow. Now, and also as a husband... What is expected of the wife is also expected of a man in the position with Christ. You're subject unto him. Just like the wife's subject to you, you're subject to him. Alright, let's uh, close there. We'll continue with chapter 3 next week.